So we are having a fascinating discussion about the future of motorsport, but not just the future of motorsport, where we go in tackling climate change, where we look at efficiencies, where we look at the evolution of technology, where we reconsider or reflect on what seems to be the answer today, but actually might not be the answer tomorrow, and consider things like unintended consequences. Because without a doubt, I remain an electric vehicle um, advocate. Uh, nothing has changed in that regard at all but I do like to just stop and check and take counsel with people who are far cleverer than I am in some of this, this detail, this important context and, and the journey of what, what happens next. And I can't think of anyone better um, than our guest today, Paddy Lowe, who's going to talk to us about a lot of things. And if you don't know who Paddy Lowe is, then I guess you don't know too much about motorsport. That's fine. Uh, but as you'll hear from what Paddy is about to tell us, there are some significant learnings from the experience and knowledge from motorsport, Formula One in particular, that Paddy has that I think are well worth um, talking about. So petrosynthesis, let me, let me please, if I can, Paddy, just ask this simple question. You shared a white paper with me and it, and it said, the thing that struck me about the title on it was, it said, the completion of the industrial revolution. And I don't, you don't need to know anything about engineering or all the clever stuff you know to be totally intrigued by that and drawn in by that as I was. So can you give us a quick introduction to that? What would you mean by the completion of the industrial process? Yeah, um, very uh, fascinated to talk about that. The, the, it, it, it's a bit of a long story, but in, in short, the, the planet has become industrialized and the, the scale of populations that we now have uh, require that. There's no going back, wh whether we like it or not. Mm -hmm. you know, the quaint idea of all living you know, in green fields and forests and picking nuts, you know, it, it, it won't work. No. Um, you know, there's eight billion people. Yeah. So for the sake of stating what might be obvious, but it actually it isn't obvious to many people because uh, it's quite stark, Every bit of carbon dioxide that, that we have put into the atmosphere from burning fossil fuels in our lifetime is still up there. Yeah. That's how it works. It doesn't, yeah. it doesn't yeah. sort of, doesn't get dissipated. Doesn't get dissipated in yeah. and, and even, you know, the carbon dioxide that, that Stevenson's rocket, first railway, engine, railway locomotive put in, the, is still up there. Mm. Um, so it, that's how it is. Mm. So now I think when we, Jump, let's jump a thousand years for sake of putting away this running out of oil right. question. My view is that w what we now need to do is invent the second half of the Industrial Revolution, which is the uh, creation part uh, that feeds that, those petrochemicals, not from fossil reserves, but from uh, live energy, real-time energy, solar energy, wind, uh, solar PV, uh, tied all the all mm. the what are called renewables so it's like completing and a circle what you're saying yeah. is this is like a missing half of a, a cycle a circle yes so in a forest amazon forest it's taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere it's taking up water mm. it's producing hydrocarbons and oxygen exact reverse of mm. the biology yeah the lung the lungs of the planet the lungs of the yeah. planet yeah so what we need to do industrially is create the Amazon in a factory mm. um, with the same parallels. So um, not, not using plants because plants are great, um, but they cannot at scale provide the level of, of material that we consume. You know, they're not single purpose. Mm. They, they do all sorts of things. Same horses, trees, mm. all the biological machines, we call them that. Um, are, are very complex, they're, they're reproducing, they evolve, they, they're very diverse for, to give themselves robustness, etc., etc. Whereas industrially, you know, engine only has an aim to produce force, power. So, so what you're saying is and it's about getting better ratios, getting a, getting a better balance. It is in effect about mimicking nature, but on an industrial scale. Correct. In effect. So yeah. it's the same chemistry. Yes. Uh, but producing, in a nutshell, petrosynthesis is about producing petroleum, synthetic petroleum, yeah. from 
renewable power, sun, yeah. wind. So just to be clever. clear, nothing to do with oil. Oil has got nothing at all to do with this. Well, it is oil, but it's it's an oil that didn't come out of the ground. Okay. So right. petroleum, okay. petroleum, which has a bad name at the moment. Yeah. Totally wrongly, petroleum is a fantastic set of chemicals that we're all right. addicted to. Actually. Right. The the problem is not petroleum. The problem is fossil petroleum. So right, the okay. problem is that it comes from fossils, and we're we're all hardwired to associate the two together. Yes. Hardwired to think. Yeah, I do. Petroleum yeah, I just did. equals fossils. Yes. Equals you know work of the devil. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no more of that. Yeah. You know, got to get away from yeah. that. Which, which is just really bizarre because we're all addicted to petroleum. Yeah. You know, whether, whether it's, uh, you know, in our toothpaste yes. tube or, our, you know, but, but don't you, you think know, so even, you know, all the, the PPE we use in these yeah. COVID times, all the, these vaccines, you know, petrochemical industry yeah, has fed indeed. all of that supply and all that technology. Yes. Many of these things inherently now, as you say, work of the devil, they're bad. And indeed they are because they're at scale, because we didn't have seven point something billion people on the planet doing X, Y, Z. So part of the problem, it seems to me, is that these things in and of themselves aren't necessarily bad, but at scale, they become bad. Um, yes. Or, yes. or and, uh, bad, maybe that's the wrong turn of phrase. They have unintended consequences. Let's put it like that. But can you just, again, just quickly define for me and, and everybody w watching, here you are, one of the most well-respected uh, engineers from the Formula One era where you, you helped develop KERS, you know, the, the energy recuperation system, harvesting energy, saving things, re recycling, all of that stuff, all of those principles and other things too. And here you are now, and I'm astonished by it, I'm very pleased to hear it, that, that someone within that arena, the pinnacle of motorsport, Formula One, talking about circular economics, talking about sustainability talking about what we must do to, to to save humanity and many other creatures on the planet so please give us just that gist of what petrosynthesis is please paddy so petrosynthesis as i've proposed to define it and uh and this is uh, the subject of my draft white paper mm -hmm. is the industrial equivalent of photosynthesis so just not to misunderstand wow. that yeah. it doesn't mean it is photosynthesis in a machine. It's not photosynthesis at all. The technology is not photosynthesis. It is the industrial equivalent of photosynthesis. Right. So it is any process which takes renewable energy, mm -hmm. which can come in any, many, many forms, and converts that into hydrocarbons using the ingredients of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the environment uh, and producing hydrocarbons and oxygen. That's the chemistry. Okay. Exact same chemistry as occurs in biology in a forest. Hence, uh, an implementation of petrosynthesis is a forest in a factory. The only things that go in are water yep. and carbon dioxide from the air and renewable power and outcome hydrocarbons and oxygen. And, and, and how, in the efficiency journey where, you know, when we look at, for example, um, direct charging, you know, with electric vehicles and where we are with the electric motor versus the electric engine, one's much more efficient than the other, but then you have a fuel tank of, of fossil fuel, incredibly energy dense compared to a battery, far less so. Um, this power to, to liquid or this transition then from one arena to, to the other, how efficient can you make that? You know, where are the losses yeah, in, in my vision of a completely circular economy, uh, uh, including particularly around energy, yeah. but also material, um, the way we are developing that is through renewable electricity. That's the source energy from the sun. Yes. Um, wind and direct solar. I mean, there are others, geothermal, tidal, mm. um, and there will be, you know, eventually nuclear fusion uh, which is effectively a renewable power. Uh, you know, I, I see written many times, well, we can't do that because think how many, you know, windmills that will take. Mm. So, well, the, you mm. know, the, there isn't an option. So yeah. you've got to go and build all those windmills. You've got to go and build all those solar panels. And we're doing it. I mean, there are vast solar farms being built 
in places like India, yes, um, in areas of land which are, which are basically uninhabitable because they're yeah. so hot. So you know we will build these renewables at, yeah. at, at enormous scale. Yeah. So, but if you can use electricity directly, then you have simply the the efficiencies of of uh, transmission uh, losses in transmission and losses in your your application. If that's a vehicle, electric car, you know, it's 10, 20, 30 percent. Uh, mm. The big problem with electrical um, is A, it's not all that portable. Mm. Um, you know, taking long wires across countries is, is uh, difficult and lossy. Mm. Um, and storage. So the, the, the ways that we have so far developed to store electricity are, are very, very poor in density. Mm. Um, in fact, compared to a, a liquid petroleum fuel like a gasoline, it's a factor of 50 mm. on mass. That's a big ratio. And, and 15 yeah. on volume. This is another factor not to forget. Mm. Volume as well, so 15 on volume. Mm. So if you look at something like an aeroplane, uh, both of those really matter. Mm. 50 times on weight is, is, is actually makes many, many, it's, it's just not even yeah, viable. Not Plus 15 on volume because an aeroplane is an aerodynamic vehicle. Yeah. Volume equals you know, bad yeah. for aerodynamics. Yes. So, um, and bear in mind, the, I get that. And bear in mind, you look at a plane, the, I mean, it's an interesting case because the, the amount of energy required by a plane is a function of its mass. Yes. So the heavier you make it, the yeah. more powerful it's got to yeah. be. Yeah. So actually to make an electric aeroplane of any significant range is just w w with a battery, mm. is just simply impossible because it, it reaches a weight where uh, it's, yeah. you know, you're using more power. Yeah. You know, yeah. the, the doesn't equation matter. doesn't work. Mm. Uh, and the next point to add to that is, well, it will one day. Mm. Um, I, I don't have that in vision at the moment and I don't think science does either. Um, because um, th there are three steps of, mm. of energy storage, three grades that are known to man at the moment. Mm. Um, first is atomic, so nuclear, mm. you know, immense energy density there, w whether it's about fusion yeah. or fission. Fun at fundamental atom level, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the next tier is um, hydrocarbon liquids, mm. So all the ones we know, diesel, yep. kerosene, petrol. Batteries, storing electricity, this is an electrochemical process. Mm. So it's, not, it's in a different tier altogether. Mm. And actually, if you go and look at the, the theoretical best battery on an electrochemical basis, uh, doesn't, doesn't get anywhere near a uh, molecular Fossil, process in terms yeah, of energy yeah, density, yeah. because you're you're dealing with elect you're storing electrons yeah. in effect, rather than storing molecules which yes. can can combine and produce energy. Um, so and that theoretical battery is a long long way off being well, delivered. Well, 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 so th this gap that I'm talking about, the 50 times gap on mass, 15 on volume, it's not going. Th there's no uh, pathway to close that gap. We can make batteries a lot better, and we are. Yes. And you know, in a 10, 20 year period, they might become twice as good mm. as they are today, mm. but they're not gonna close that 50 times gap. No, 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 they're not. Now, this short film is about trying to understand what the future of motorsport can be or should be, certainly in this mm. fast accelerating, what we might call electric age. Um, and a little play on words that they like to have on this is, is it eclectic or is it electric? Um, and I think what you've been describing and what I've learned from a number of people is it's more eclectic than just electric. Let's just focus for a second on Formula One if we can, because you do know a little bit about that. Um, what's your sense and flavour then of, of where the next, let's call it five to ten years are going to go with Formula One with potentially using synthetic fuels? Um, rather than just becoming in another, you know, electric series, because we've already got one of those called Formula E. Yes. So what happens next? You know, I worked in Formula One for more than 30 years. And mm. I don't work in Formula One at the moment. Mm. So I think the first thing I'd say is, it, you know, Formula One will take a path and, and it's not for me to judge where that should 
okay. should be. Um, you know, I think they've got to find their own, their own way. Um, so far, they've pursued a hybrid uh, powertrain format mm -hmm. um, with great success, actually, yeah. from a technology point of view. So the hybrid engines in Formula One introduced in 2014 are now 50% thermally efficient. Uh, and this is nothing to do with recovery under braking. This right. is in steady state. In six years, they've pretty much improved by 1% per year mm. to, to now being around 50%, mm. which is incredible. If you think it is. the internal combustion engine in, in the road cars, they have gone perhaps from 20%, 25 to 30% in a period of 100 years. So, you know, what's been done in Formula One with hybrid engines and their efficiency is incredible. You know, can we get to 60%, 70%? How far can we actually go, theoretically? Yeah, frankly, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, <laughs> I think um, there will be some fundamental limits. Yes. Um, but um, they will keep pushing forward. So let me just get this right. 2009, first Formula One win in a Kurs powered car. It was Lewis Hamilton. You would have been, were you on the pit wall then watching that? How, can you, what he had? It was a great day because actually, uh, you know, I was at McLaren in those years and, and we'd had a very tough year actually because we came out of the blocks with a new set of regulations aerodynamically mm. and around Kurs. Uh, we were literally the worst team. Uh, at the beginning of the season right? Um, because we'd misjudged the regulations. We'd been in an intense competition the previous mm -hmm. year with Ferrari uh, for the win. And we went from front to back. So it was a point of great pride that by the time we got to Hungary, we won our first race that year mm -hmm. on merit. And actually it was also the first Kerr's win. And not only was Kerr's present on the car, it actually made the win possible because uh, Lewis Hamilton's overtake on Mark Webber was, was a Kurz assisted right. overtake, right. which took him from second to first. So and Mark Webber wasn't so happy about that moment. Though, no, because he didn't have a Kurz. <laughs> yeah. So in those days, not everybody had Kurz. Wow, yeah. um, so, you know, Mercedes had done a terrific job. Yeah. It was the best Kurz in, uh, in the whole paddock. There were, yes. Well, there were only were two or three. What I said earlier on about your white paper and, and this, this focus, not just on um, motorsport, not just on automotive, but the bigger picture challenge of the day, which we've all got, and you, you mm. clearly articulate that in, in regard to climate change. Um, I've felt talking to a number of people now in and around motorsport, especially Formula One, inevitably, because that's where a lot of the, the, the best engineers are, you know, gravitate to. That, that a lot of the capability sits within these people, within these teams, and that if we're not careful, if we just allow the transition to much more um, uh, use of electric vehicles and, and far less use of, of combustion engine technology, there's a danger that we could dismantle Formula One. I mean, am I being extreme here, but is, is this a scenario where where we dis disband, dismantle all these amazing people that could do extraordinary things for so much, you know, so many other challenges. Mm. Is that, do you, sh would you share that thought, that, that uh, potential? That, I, I, that doesn't concern me. I, I, I think Formula One um, is very enduring um, and, you know, has a great ability to survive okay. all sorts of ups and downs. Mm. So, um, you know, the, 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 there uh, isn't any fear on that side from, from my point of view. Right. Where, what pathway they take is, is complicated. And yes. you know, one, of, one of the features of Formula One is a very wide range of stakeholders um, who don't always all want the same thing. <laughs> um, so you know, we'll see what, you know, where that lands yeah. uh, over the next decade. Yes, I, I um, Ross Braun said something, I think it was at a FIA conference recently, where he actually said, this is a message to the manufacturers. We've got one point something billion vehicles on the planet. They're going to be here for another 20 years. You guys have to come up with solutions to deal with that, with the existing powertrains that we've got. So that must mean fuels, mm -hmm. um, e-fuels. Now, uh, there's something on the table here. Now, I know they're not, they're, they're not samples that we've had to take for some <laughs> medical reason, uh, Paddy. Can you just tell us what, what we've got here and just talk, talk yeah. us through this, please? Uh, I mean, that's actually sort of a bigger source from our lab work, but I've separated out. So in, the, in there we have gasoline 
on the top and that's actually water right because this particular step okay. of the process yeah um, produces water and and gasoline but i've sort of separated out the gasoline there so that's that is a synthetic gasoline um or petrol to yeah or e-fuels people call them as well well is, is, yeah they, they, so they, they, there are a lot of names for these fuels mm. essentially they're made from renewable power renewable yeah. electricity yeah so that uh, is fed into uh, hydrogen electrolyzers. So hydrogen electrolyzer takes water and separates it into hydrogen mm. and oxygen. Mm. So that hydrogen is, is itself already an intermediate fuel, mm. uh, much more uh, you know, suitable for storage than electricity um, and useful for a very wide range of, of applications mm. and you know the hydrogen economy has been talked about for many years and is actually you know gathering a lot of momentum yeah is it is it um, finally because it always seems to be you know and i'm what i'm 62 and i've only kind of had a broad uh, knowledge of s some of these things if i'm really honest with you but it's always seemed to be it's coming it's 10 years away it's whatever yeah, yeah. i mean what, what's inhibited it up until now then in reality i think really the use case right. so on yes. paper it, it's terrific but if you want the ultimate in energy density, uh, you have to go to the back to the petroleum liquids. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not an advocate of uh, petroleum, synthetic petroleum solutions only. I'm an advocate of a balanced approach, which is to say and recognise in the current uh, days we live that that I see too much. Uh, uh, one way thinking. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's um, it's simplistic. It's binary. It's, it's yeah. It doesn't take into account unintended consequences, supply chain challenge, and all of these Correct. things. There's you know, an interesting thing about synthetic petroleums is that the, you know what's levelled against it all the time is the cost. Mm. Cost to produce a synthetic, you know, this synthetic gasoline mm. uh, cannot, it, you know, currently be produced. At the at the the price that we can dig up fossil equivalents. Mm. What, why is that? Is it well? Of scale I think or frankly, it? it's because fossil fuels are just you know, ridiculously cheap. Yeah. Uh, and you know, incredible energy density. Mm. But sell you know fossil fuels sell for less than milk, Red Bull. Yeah. You can say that. Uh, Water, even water. If you buy it in a bottle. Yeah, no, you're exactly. right. Yeah, it's outrageous. That. Yeah, yeah. So when when people say synthetic petroleums are too expensive, what they mean is we live in a very distorted economy where the the cost of a fuel which was developed by nature over literally hundreds and hundreds mm. of millions of years, mm. and we are consuming without really reflecting that value. Uh, so we live in the luxury. So I talked about jumping forward a thousand years. They will look back on this as a, as a windfall moment in human history where we had the use of fossil energy and we consumed it. Uh, but it was a windfall. It was a bootstrap. Yeah. If, we're, if, we are, if we are clever, and we are, the human race is clever and innovative mm. and resourceful and, and always will do what's necessary mm. to survive. We need to turn that windfall into a bootstrap mm. to the circular system. Yeah, and we, and we get, will. And we need and we to will. get on with that, don't we? Because we do this, need to. This we know how to. Growth we also, it, it, it's not as though we don't know how to do it. I mean, I, I've shown people this fuel and say, look, you know, it's made that doesn't come yeah. from fossils, and they look at you like you you said you've, yeah. you've said alchemy works. Yes. Yeah, yeah, voodoo. It's yeah. voodoo talk. But actually, when you explain it and you look at it logically. It, you know, the same way an olive tree produces olive oil, it, it's exactly the same. Yeah, yeah, it's no yeah. different. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what, what's uh, leveled at synthetic petroleum at the moment is that the, the price is too high, and that, that's absolutely true. But, but one thing to say is the price is at least calculable. So we, we know how much it will cost to mm. make a synthetic gasoline or synthetic jet fuel. Um, and and you're looking at it it's all in the plant mm. okay uh downstream from that there's no cost because this is an identical drop-in replacement to our current fuel systems so mm. all your distribution storage all your vehicles have no new cost 
because you all those assets carry on business as usual. Mm. Um, so whilst the cost of the fuel is high, mm. the, the, the other inferred costs are effectively yeah, zero. Yeah, they're kind of sunk costs. Electrification, there, um, the, the problem with electrification is we don't actually know the cost of delivering all our electrification yeah. because it, it, it feeds into you know, upscaling the grid, mm. upscaling all the supply side, uh, digging charging up a lot points, of minerals and that we haven't yet. Digging yep. up minerals yep. that we don't know where they, they come yeah. from. So the, the cost of total electrification is unquantifiable at the moment. Yes. So what I would advocate is a balance. Uh, we need a balance. There are three energy media, mm. electrification, hydrogen, mm. hydrocarbon, liquid fuels. Yeah. Yeah. They each have their merits. This, you know, you start the most efficient, gets less and less efficient as you go down that through that sequence. Yeah. Um, but it becomes more and more dense, more and more portable, uh, and you know the utility goes up. Yeah. Let's say, so and different vehicles will need different things. This so, is it. I think I, what my takeaway from what you've said is it's a, it's application specific. Um, solution to, to the technology, to the duty cycle, to the performance requirement, etc. So in other, in other words, there's no one size fits all. Correct. Um, and then the other bit, for sure, this completion of the industrial you know, revolution as a cycle, where we're only halfway around at the moment, and, and it's just been linear. Mm. Uh, and we've got away with that, so to speak. But Paddy, you, you've really given me, all, and I think a lot of people watching this, some real food for thought. It isn't about kicking back on electric vehicles. No, not it at all. It isn't back about let's just try and you know keep Formula One going for another ten or twenty years. You know, grasping at straws or all those sort of things. It's about being cognizant of the fundamentals of science and of physics and, and reality, and finding the best application specific solutions whether they're in the energy use or, or the construction of the mechanics or, or whatever it is. And, you know, it's, this has been a fantastic opportunity for me and I hope I've been able to put this, you know, you and others have put this across to people that, um, you know, w we can't just go down and let's make everything battery electric, full stop, it's all sorted. Well, it would be it, nice, but it isn't going to work that way. Let me it? give you a great example, Roger, and we'll get away from Formula One because, uh, you know, okay. it is what it is. <laughs> Combine harvester. Right, okay. okay. The reason you and I, Roger, are sitting here having a friendly chat and not out in a field somewhere, you know, yeah. cutting corn, the scythe, yeah. is because of the mechanisation of agriculture. Good point. Yeah. My neighbour here uh, farms all around here and... This village used to employ three quarters of the people for the farm mm. 100 years ago. Three quarters of the residents wow. ran this farm. He farms all the same land on his own now. Wow. So there's two reasons for that. One is technology, mm. tractors, combines, etc., And the other is the energy that's coming from, from fossil fuel, mm. diesel in that case. So you need both. The technology, we've invented that. That yes. can't be uninvented. So how do you keep going I indefinitely? And I did a very interesting calculation the other day because I suddenly got worried. Because if, if it turned out you couldn't make synthetic fuel, which is the most dense industrialised way we have to make diesel, mm. is through synthesis, not, mm. not biofuel. That takes a lot of land. Yeah. But to make it, industrially you know in a factory which is which is what we're working on mm. which is which is the petrosynthesis subject mm. how much land would it take mm. uh, to supply the diesel to cultivate that same land because mm. if if it took more you know if that equation didn't work we, we are actually screwed mm. society will not work <laughs> because w there'll come a day we can't get, and we're gonna have to go back in the yeah. field yeah. and start digging Oh, I'm not ready uh, for that. I'm too old. So to start no. Well, the good news paddy. was I did the quick calcs, and easily within one percent of of your your field of wheat, uh, hundred acres within just one acre, uh, I, I can make gather up the energy to create uh, synthetically the diesel that will cultivate the other ninety nine acres. So that's good news. Yes, that it is. means. Long, long, long term, the human race can survive 
at this scale. Mm. Mm. Well, that's a that is a very positive note to finish on because. Uh, you know, we're all challenged these days is what will happen next with the you know what thing that's been going on for a year, mm. let alone the other, you know, ongoing challenge. Um, Paddy, this has been fascinating. Uh, and I look forward to finding out much more about what you're doing and seeing it, you know, as a successful part of a number of solutions that we've got, you know, hence your message. Uh, but for now, thank you so much. Thanks well, thanks for, for the opportunity, Roger. You know, it's obviously you can tell it's a a, a favourite topic of mine yeah. and I, I enjoy explaining it. Yeah, so you thank speak you. with passion and that's thank the, you. you know, if passion is behind something, it has momentum. Passion is one of the best energy sources, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. Good, no, thank you.